thanks, Sue. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Alan Chapman for inviting me. Uh, I've known Alan for since he was a little boy, since he didn't have gray hair, a long time. But I've, like Sue said, I've worked uh, on marine mammal issues for the state of Washington for uh, 37 years. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just seals and salmon um, and the work that we've done. Um, uh, up, down, up. And I want to, um, the, the Chasco paper, um, which is this estimation of um, pinniped consumption of Chinook salmon. I'm going to talk a little bit about that but uh, and help understand that paper a little bit. But uh, the first thing I want to do um, is talk a little bit about um, who, who, who needs Chinook salmon and why the Chasco paper was originally written. Um, killer whales, uh, southern residents, 82% of their diet, the majority of their diet of, is Chinook s salmon. So um, the big question was, because uh, southern resident killer whales, their populations are, there's only about 84 animals in that population. They've actually been decreasing in the last couple of years. And because of their dependence on Chinook salmon, in order to recover killer whales, we need to re recover Chinook salmon population. So the status of Chinook was the, really the driver for the Chasco paper. And how do we, how do we um, recover Chinook populations uh, to benefit everyone, but including, including uh, killer whales? So Chinook salmon is one of the, the uh, vital signs for the Puget Sound Partnership. And this is their report card for the status of for their 2015 report card on the status of Chinook salmon st stocks in Puget Sound. And <clears throat> this, this, this little thing is their progress on recovery is getting worse. So the status of, kill of Chinook salmon in Puget Sound, um, this is, these, are, these are their recovery goals for Chinook salmon. These bars are all where they want Chinook populations to be. And these are all the river systems in Puget Sound that have Chinook salmon in them. So, um, you know, it's, it's pretty bleak. Um, and the, uh, the information that was given about um, improving uh, habitat and streams for, for the Nooksack applies for all these systems in Puget Sound. They all need that same sort of remediation and effort to recover the habitat that's been destroyed over time. Um, the Chasco paper, it came out in 2017. I'm a co-author on it. It's in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. Um, and it basically compared, uh, and, and, and Michael Schmidt talked about this in his talk, but um, it looked at four marine mammal predators, killer whales, stellar sea lions, California sea lions, and harbor seals. Um, and I'm going to get back to the paper uh, a little bit later, but I just want to talk a little bit about the harbor seal component of, of that, that paper. Um, in the San Juan Islands, there's about 150 haul-out sites. Uh, the Salish Sea has the highest densities of harbor seals in the world. Um, harbor seal populations in Washington are divided into actually, uh, in the inland waters, there's actually three stocks. There's a Hood Canal stock, um, Southern Puget Sound stock, and a Northern, Northern Washington inland water stock. And there's another, there's another stock that's the uh, Oregon Washington coastal stock. Um, there's another stock that's in the Strait of Georgia, which is in, in British Columbia waters. In general, all of, this, all of the uh, populations in um, the Salish Sea, all these stocks are healthy and robust. And under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, in order to manage uh, a marine mammal species, you have to be within what they call the uh, optimal sustainable population range, which is OSP. And it's a range between um, 
maximum, maximum net productivity and carrying capacity, or K. So that's, that's the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed in 72, 1972. It basically placed a total moratorium on taking of marine mammals. So it's the Marine Mammal Protection Act, it's not the Marine Mammal Management Act. So there's actually very little, op there are very little options under the Marine Mammal Protection Act to, to manage uh, any marine mammal species unless you show that they're within that OSP range. So. These are the these are the haul out sites that are in the in the Salish Sea, um, the uh, the stock the stocks that I talked talked about. There's a stock in Hood Canal, which is right here. There's about 2,000 harbor seals in this stock. The uh, Puget Sound, Southern Puget Sound stock is uh, the the the, the uh, haul out sites that are south of a line, basically from. Kingston to Edmonds, all the animal, all the seals on the, in that lower stock. There's about 2,000 harbor seals in this stock. This inland, this inland stock, um, water stocks includes all the rest. So all these other these other haul out sites. And there's about uh, in the in the in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. There's about 3,000 harbor seals. Uh, in the San Juan Islands, there's about 5,000 harbor seals in, the, in what we call these the Eastern Bays, which includes Boundary Bay, uh, Bellingham Bay, Sam, uh, Padilla Bay, Skagit Bay. Uh, there's another 2,000 harbor seals. So the inland stock, it, the total inland population is about 16,000 harbor seals. They use haul out sites, which is just where they rest. This is actually on. on uh, Whale rocks, which is in uh, in Cattle Pass, they when the tide goes out, these these spits are exposed, these reefs are exposed, and uh, seals haul out and rest. And <clears throat> we do these surveys during the pupping season. So this is an this is an August survey, and if you look at this, you can I know the people in the back can't see this, but there's these 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 little white animals in here are pups. So they have their pups in July and August. So in July and August, we go out and do a uh, survey to, to do uh, the population abundance estimate. So that's in the set, the typical haul out site in, in uh, the San Juans. This is actually a Portage Spit, which is over just uh, north of Portage Island. Um, again, this is a closer up view of that. Again, there's the, the, little, the little white dots in here there's there's bigger animals, but the little white dots are pups. So again, this is August of 2014, and this is uh, this is in Bellingham Harbor, uh, and you can't see it very well, but there's about 50 harbor seals stretched out on these boom sticks in in uh, in uh, downtown Bellingham. Um, the, <clears throat> this is the 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 trend lines. We published a paper in 2003 looking at the the status of harbor seals in in the uh, in Washington, and um, basically the populations grew. Uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed in 1972, so since beginning in 1972, we started doing surveys, and we've got these surveys in. This is the Strait of Juan de Fuca. These are what are called the Eastern Bays. This is Hood Canal. These are the San Juan Islands. This is Puget Sound, and this is the this is the total inland stock. And the, the scales are different on the sides here, um, but again, uh, there's about 16,000 uh, harbor seals in the inland waters. This is for the Strait of Georgia uh, <clears throat> Canadian data, but it basically is the same trend where uh, in the 1970s, uh, they were protected in Canada as well. Uh, basically, the populations grew and at some point they leveled off and are, and are at carrying capacity. So, um, like I said, harbor seal popul populations in, in the Salish Sea are, are healthy and robust. Um, the, thing that's <laughs> the thing that's happening happening in the last five years is big killer whales, they used to be called transients, these are the mammal eaters, so, the, so they've actually up to, uh, before 2003, transients were rarely seen in Puget Sound in the in the Salish Sea. So, beginning in 2000 and in 2003, 2005, there were uh, transients that were in, in Hood Canal. They ate about about a thousand harbor seals when they were in Hood Canal. So, right now they're they've been in the Salish Sea, and they're actually 
seen more often, they were seen more often this summer than the, than the southern residents in the inland waters of Washington and British Columbia. So they're in there, they're eating harbor seals. Each killer whale needs about a, a harbor seal a day. So if you can, you know, you can do the math. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, are they having any impact? And, and what's, what's going on with the harbor seal population? Um, we really haven't looked at the trend data yet, but th these are these are density estimates from boat surveys that that Fish and Wildlife has been doing, uh, starting in 2005. And if you look at the 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 uh, the density of harbor seals that we've seen in, in this 10-year period, it's actually been decreasing in, in the last 10 years. So actually, harbor seal numbers are are actually decreasing in Puget Sound. We don't know exactly why they may have overshot carrying capacity or getting eaten by eaten by transients. We don't actually know what the cause is, but that's that's the abundant stuff. Uh, the diet work. What do they eat? Um, we uh, published a paper in 2009. Uh, looked at diet in Hood Canal, uh, South Puget Sound, and San Juan Islands. We also did another paper in 2012 looking at uh, how harbor seals might impact de depressed fish runs, fish stocks. Um, and this was actually, we wrote this paper, um, we were looking at because rockfish stocks had just been listed as endangered under the ES ESA, so we wanted to know what impact uh, harbor seals might be having on rockfish. So there's a couple of papers that we've published on diet. Um, and this is from the, the Lance Jeffries paper. But if you look at their diet, it's, it's, a, it's a whole ver variety of prey. They don't just eat salmon. Uh, the, first, the first two bar graphs are actually salmon. The first one is adult salmon. So in the summer, 55% of their diet, harbor seal diet, based on scats, was adult salmonids. And it's made up of Chinook, Coho, Chum, and Pink. Um, a smaller percentage is made up of juvenile salmon. But, uh, so that's the salmon. <clears throat> but uh, Michael talked about anchovies increasing. so. And this is this this these, we collected these uh, scats in 2006 and 2007. So in 2007, anchovies were actually 15% of their diet. So anchovies were already in the system in 2007. This is this is this is clupioids. These are these are herring. So herring, herring <coughs> excuse me, herring is a big uh, driver as well, and. Uh, Sand lance, if you look at sand lance, and if you, so sand lance are, are a candlefish. So if you, and they're basically anchovies, herring, and sand lance are all forage fish. So if you, if you actually total the forage fish together, it's forage fish are really uh, dominant prey for, for almost everything in Puget Sound. Herring feeds salmon, and you know, the herring link, the anchovy link. So, but the forage fish are pretty, pretty important. And then the other one are the gaddits, and that, that includes hake, the, the cod species, and it makes up about 30% of their diet. So there's this, actually Alan t said this to me, they, you know, this, there's this, I'll call it uh, urban myth that they only, that seals only eat the bellies out of salmon. Um, they actually eat the whole thing. Sometimes they eat the bellies because that's that's where they're going for eggs. But they 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 eat other parts. So they 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 kill them. They bring them to the surface. You can actually document their kills because that's visu visual. Um, for big fish, you can't see what they eat. The small fish because they eat them underwater. But for big fish, they they bring them to the surface. But that's the salmon. The salmon are are, are a, a, a predominant component. Herring, the forage fish, I already said this, but they're, they're, a, they're an important component. And these are, these are hake, whiting, again, the gadded. Uh, and those are the main drivers. If you look at harbor or pinniped diet, uh, whether it's seals, sea lions, um, salmon, adult salmon, a cod, and a forage fish are the primary prey of all of the species of pinnipeds that we have on the West Coast. Um, 
I want to talk, so the, the, the Long Live the Kings, the Salish Sea Salmon Survival Project is actually looking at this juvenile salmonid component. So, and Michael already talked about um, this a little bit in his, in his talk, but they do eat fry, they eat small fish, uh, they eat uh, chum fry, they eat pink fry, and they also eat smolts, uh, so juvenile fish. Um, so that's, that's <clears throat> the Chasco paper basically uh, went through, and again, they looked at the, these three marine mammal species. They, we reviewed the literature, so we didn't really have recent diet data that was used, Salish Sea specific data. Um, um, and it has, it has, a, has some drawbacks. So the, the, what we're doing right now in the Salish Sea project, and Mike talked about this, is looking at that juvenile survival to fill in the, the, the information needs to, to identify these potential predators on juvenile salmon. And so we're, we're collecting scats. Uh, we're working on this component, the predator component of the potential mortality in, uh, for juveniles steelhead sal and salmonids in Puget Sound. So we're actually, we're focused on this right now. We're collecting scat data. Um, and it's, it's really complicated. It's a food web model. Um, it has to consider all the different predators, size and, size and trends in those populations, where there's seasonal, seasonal overlap, um, and, we're, and what their diet overlap is. Where there's, is there synergy and connection with all these components? And it, and it, and it provides the support for impl impl implementation of an ecosystem-based management plan. So that's what we're working on right, right now. And, and, and like I said, Michael described that, the work of the Long Live the Kings pro program. Um, and I would just, I'm just gonna say then that, to end it, um, we all depend on salmon. It's an it's a, it's a iconic species. Um, this is the, t the tip of the South Jetty at the Columbia River. There's harbor seals that eat salmon. There's California sea lions that eat salmon. These are stellar sea lions. These are cormorants. These are gulls. Um, so there are a lot of the species that, that, uh, that are in the marine environment that, that uh, depend on salmon. Killer whales depend on salmon. And we all depend on salmon. So um, I think that the whole, you know, the, the Salish Sea is such a cherished place and that we, we really have to try and restore it because it's, we, we put a lot of stressors on it and, the, and, the, and the, we all depend on the Salish Sea. So the recovery and management of the ecosystem is, is the ultimate goal of what we're all involved with. So with that, I'll answer any questions. So there was a, a, a Michael, at, was, I think you asked Michael a question about Seal on the seal on the menu. Yeah, I know. But uh, the other thing um, is that harbor seals that inhabit Puget Sound have six to eight times the contaminant load of harbor seals in the Strait of Georgia, and that's the whole what's going on with the Puget Sound because it's you c you couldn't eat them. Their their contaminant load is too high. So I just. Uh wanted to uh, take the privilege of saying thank you. Uh, one of the difficulties, you said Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, uh, if you consider the lifetime and reproductive lifespan for any of the marine mammals, we've only got data for a few generations, which isn't much to talk about trends and status. And so uh, when you talk about these dynamics, um, it almost understates the importance and the threats to the biosphere here, uh, whether it be salmon, all the way through into the marine mammals. What you've got here is a dynamic where we're just beginning to measure the infancy of cycles of generations. And so um, even if uh, these are few studies, they're, they're essential and very important. I've worked with marine mammals off and on uh, since the 1970s. And, um, and then with other things, these ecosystem restoration. Um, I can't say how important it is also to have studies that go back and review the literature 
and incorporate the oldest data, even if it means that we have to become qualitative or less sophisticated in our programming and modeling. Uh, qualitative or, uh, let's say, non-statistical uh, clean uh, regressions may not be the answer, but what you're doing here uh, is very much on the right track. So thank you. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, the one thing about the Marine Mammal Protection Act, that it really doesn't allow for much management, but it requires the resource managers to collect the data before they do management. And a lot of times we exploit fishery resources without knowing what the biomass is. We don't know what the status of anything is. We exploit it, we overexploit it, boom and bust. Where with marine mammals, we've been collecting the data based because of the Marine Mammal Protection Act to undertake management if the will of the people, you know, wanted us to manage them. But it's it's the Marine Mammal Protection Act, not the Marine Mammal Management Act. So it has to be changed a little bit to make us make it workable. The, the next speakers will probably deal with this a little bit, but uh, uh, in the 70s, I was involved, I was a fish cop. And the question is, is, is it marine mammals or is it saturation fishing due to the, the advent of the internal combustion engine on a fishing boat and, um, and, and all, that's going on since, all that's going on since then. Big question, you're with Fish and Wildlife, who are the fish cops along the Nooksack? It, it's, it's, these, are, these are tough issues as well. The question is, is it people or is it marine life that, that are uh, destroying our, our Chinooks? Is it uh, saturation fishing or is it habitat degradation? I sort of suspect the former. And one of the big reasons is due to a comment that uh, but by the, the, the head of, of, of enforcement in Alaska, larcenies in the heart of every fisherman. That is the question. Um, Mammals or people? Uh, I don't have a short answer to that comment. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thank you.